we are going to the we are going to the fourth session of this training program and today the topic is introduction to who ladder and non opioids the learning outcomes of this session will be uh, regarding understanding of mechanism of action side effects and use of nsaids uh, this session also covers a lecture interactive lecture and discussion on drugs in neuropathic pain and other adjuvants including corticosteroids the session will be covered by uh, dr mary abraham uh, dr mary abraham she's uh, she done, did her md from all india institute of medical science she also did dnb faca and diploma in hospital management she is a neuroanesthesiologist and pain and palliative care expert she is a visiting consultant at max hospital new delhi max institute of cancer care lajpat nagar indian spinal injury center new delhi and she owns a pr private clinic in new delhi she has awarded lifetime achievement by delhi neurological association for contribution to neurosciences in delhi that was in 2017 she also authored a book conquering pain in 2019 uh we all welcome you to this uh, session ma'am for the for taking the session and over to you ma'am thank you so much for your introduction madhu and uh, i understand that i'm uh, talking to a group of oncologists which i presume Uh, it will be a medical radiation and even surgical oncologist because usually I talk to anesthesiologists, so this is a little different. And I'm sure many of you must be aware of more things than me. But still, I still try to talk through this session. And uh, without much ado, I would like to share the screen, please. uh i will be talking about pain management and this is a broad outline of my talk i will talk about the basics of the who analgesi ladder with the focus on step 1 and step 2 drugs also covering the adjuvant drugs and drugs for neuropathy now the who analgesi ladder was devised based on the recommendations of a group of international experts more than uh, nearly 30 years ago and subsequently it has been translated into 22 languages and served as a catalyst for treating cancer pain worldwide and it has stood the test of time and even today we are following the who analgesic ladder not just for cancer pain but also for acute pain and for non cancer chronic pain as well so this is a simple well validated and effective and it is basically a step wise approach to treat cancer pain depending on the severity of pain now prior to the ladder people were dying with patients were dying in unnecessary pain for two reasons first of all there was a lot of drug regulations associated with the use of opioids not only was the patient hesitant to taking it thinking that they will become addicts the relatives also did not want it but even the doctors themselves were hesitant to prescribe opioids because of the stringent rules associated with uh, prescribing opioids when storing and uh, dispensing opioids all that was a big problem secondly there was a stigma associated with the uh, taking opioids and uh, they were uh, often dubbed opioid addicts you know and they feared they will become addicted to opioids. but when the who it self endorsed this tool it actually legitimized the use of opioids and it became more and more uh, used all over the world but before you apply the ladder we must do a comprehensive assessment of pain which i presume has been dealt with in the previous talk a simple mnemonic for that assessment of pain is p q r s t and q of which we are be focusing on the severity of pain because the ladder is based on the intensity or the severity of pain so this is what we need to know the second thing we need to know is the type of pain that the patient is having is it a nociceptive pain which is due to tissue injury or is it a neuropathic pain which is due to a disease or a lesion in the nervous system or is it a combination of two in cancer very frequently it is both a combination of nociceptive and neuro 
it's important to distinguish that because according to that, you may have to add adjuvant drugs as well. Now, I'll start with a case scenario. A 35-year-old father of two young kids had squamous cell carcinoma in the right upper lobe of the lung. The pain was deep-seated gnawing pain in the right suprascapular and infraclavicular areas. He was unable to sleep. And uh, also, in addition to that, he had a burning and tingling sensation in the arm as well. This is a little alteration I would make to this. He was unable to sleep. The pain score, I would like to change the score. This was NRS2, I mean, NRS4 during the day and 6 at night. Kindly bear with me. I, I just had to alter this a little bit, which I was not able So he had not only a deep and a gnawing type of pain in the shoulder, but he was also having pain radiating along the arm, which was more of a burning and a tingling than can. Now, when you come to the WHO energetic ladder, you want to apply it. So, it is basically a three-step ladder. The original ladder was a three-step ladder, in which step one is given for patients with mild pain, where the NRS score is less than four, where you give a non-opioid analgesic with or without an adjuvant, depending upon whether other characteristics are there for the pain. If the patient is not responding to step one drugs, then you move on to step two. Or if the NRS is uh, around four, uh, four to six, and or the pain is moderate in intensity, then you add a weak opioid to the non-opioid drug with or without an edge. And if the patient is not responding to this also, that is the pain is severe, the NRS would be in the range of more than eight, then you substitute the weak opioid with a strong opioid with or without a non-opioid and with or without an edge. Now, using this three-step ladder, nearly 71 to 76 patients percent of cancer pain can get satisfactory. So that is a huge uh, amount of uh, number of patients who are getting relief just by applying this WHO analgesic ladder, which is a very simple and easily applicable now, the salient features of the ladder. The three important things we need to remember, it is by mouth, by ladder, by clock. Now, by mouth is all these drugs are given orally. That is a standard route for administration of these, even for the strong, strong opioid. It is well suited for home care and for the uh, relative can give the, if they explain properly, they can give the med medicines themselves or the visiting nurse can give it. So, it is a very... Uh, uh, easily uh, suitable for patients at home. The second thing is, it is by the ladder. Normally, we start from step one, and according to the severity of pain, we move up the ladder. But there are exceptions to this, and sometimes when the pain is very severe, we can straight away start with step three. Of course, when you start with the uh, drugs, uh, we have to do a titration that will be dealt with in the next uh, class. So we can, uh, there can be a little variation to this, but normally we start from step one and go up. The third important thing is it's by the clock. Now, cancer pain can be continuous and it can be also incident pain. Now, because it is continuous, you need to give drugs round the clock. And it is based on the duration of action of the drug, not on a PRN basis. That is very important. It's not when the pain comes back that you give the drug, but you give it according to the duration of action of the drug. Because otherwise, it needs to break through pain and the whole purpose is defeated and the patient gets uncomfortable again. So, uh, for example, if you're giving immediate release morphine, then the duration of action is only four hours, so you have to repeat it every four hours. This has to be explained to the patient. Like if you're taking the medicine at six in the morning, the next dose is at 10, then it is at 2, and then at... So you have to explain the time to the patient. They have to maintain this chart. Or if it's paracetamol, is given every 6 hours. Or if it is a, a selective NSAID, then you give it only once a day. So that has to be explained very clearly to the patient. Another important thing is it is individualized to the patient. The right dose is the one that relieves the pain. And that can vary between patient to patient depending upon the extent of the disease 
or it can even depend upon the threshold of the patient. So in one patient, maybe 30 milligram morphine can produce good pain relief. But in another patient who has got maybe more severe disease or is more anxious or more uh, or has a lower threshold of pain, then that, that patient may require as much as 300 milligrams. But that is the right dose for that patient. So uh, that is very important. And also we have to tell them that if there is a breakthrough pain, then what do you do? So it has to be very much individualized. Then, of course, there are the use of adjuvant drugs depending upon the specific type of pain that the patient is having. And uh, I'll talk about it later. And attention to detail is very important. The patient's age, his body habitus, the comorbidities, the body weight of the patient, and the side effect profile, everything has to be meticulously modeled. So we have to pay attention to details. So the advantages of the WHO analgesic bladder is it's very simple and easily understandable to prove, and it's validated. That means it has been found to be effective, proven to be effective. It's also very cost-effective because drugs like morphine, methadone, the paracetamol, NSAIDs, they are all very uh, inexpensive. It can be implemented across the world, even in underdeveloped countries, well suited for home care, and it can also be given for acute and chronic non-cancer pain as well. And like I said, there could be modifications to the ladder. You can omit step two, you can go directly to step three. You can even add a fourth step uh, particularly in patients who are not responding to even the step three drugs, that is a strong hope. So in 2000, this fourth step was added with the ladder. It's for patients with difficult pain or intractable pain. You can give a nerve block or you can give an epidural or a patient controlled analgesia pump. You can give a neurolytic block or spinal cord stimulators or an intrathecal pump. So these interventions can be done as a fourth step or sometimes it can even be done earlier as well if it is in. So this is for those uh, about 10 to 15 percent of patients who do not respond to the B-step analysis. Now let me discuss step one. Uh, they are the ones that we give for mild to moderate pain, include paracetamol and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which can be combined with an adjuvant drug. Now, paracetamol is known as acetaminophen in the Western countries. Its action is predominantly central. It inhibits the enzyme cyclooxygenase or COX in the central nervous system. It does not have an effect on peripheral COX. So the side effect profile is less with paracetamol as compared to NSAIDs, which inhibits the peripheral COX. Its action is predominantly antipyretic and analgesic. It has no significant anti -inflammatory. Now, we are all aware, you all must be aware of the dose of paracetamol. You can give in doses of 12 to 15 milligram per kg every six hours. That should be important because the duration of action is only six hours. You can go up to three grams a day. The daily dose should not exceed four grams, and a single dose should be less than one. The normal dose, which we generally give, is 650 mg. We also have one gram. PCM sustained release tablet in which uh, 300 mg is released instantly and the remaining 700 over a period of the next 12 months. It can also be given as infusion. One gram can be given six hourly. And when the oral route is not feasible, like in patients with head and neck cancer or with the, the CA labbing, so anything like that, we can even use a rectal route as well. Very safe for pediatric use a dose of 15 mg per kg every six hours. Toxicity occurs only in doses of more than 90 mg per kg. The numbers needed to treat. This is uh, it's called NNT. So this indicates the efficacy of any particular drug. The lower the NNT, the more efficacious is a drug. So what is NNT? It's a number of patients who receive the drug for one to have 50% relief over the next four hours. So the NNT of paracetamol 650 mg is five. That means for every five patients, one will have good. So it's not that good and efficacious. Like ibuprofen and diclofenac have got a lower NNT. So this is the NNT of paracetamol. 
but it has got a lot of advantages. It has got a good safety profile, no adverse effect on the gastric mucosa, so bad tolerated by patients with peptic ulcer, no adverse renal effects, no effects on platelet function. So it can be given for those who have got, uh, uh, you know, who are on uh, various uh, drugs like, uh, uh, you know, antiplatelet drugs or who have got some platelet now, it's tolerated by two-thirds of patients who are hypersensitive to aspirin. That's one advantage, and it does not affect the plasma uric acid. But the drawbacks are that it has to be given every six hours, has no anti-inflammatory action, it has a potential for hepatic toxicity, but that is in doses of more than four grams a day or in those with impaired liver function and those who take excessive alcohol, or whose body weight is less than 50 kg, in which you can actually decrease a dose. And even in liver disease, you can give doses of 2 to 3 grams per day safely, keeping a watch on the liver. So it has an important role to play in cancer pain. It's a mainstay drug of the WHO analgesic ladder. It's given at every step of the ladder. It can be given in step 1 in combination as NSAID because it improves the NNT. Uh, it can be given with tramadol as step two, or it can be given along with opioids as step two. As a got a good safety profile, it also causes an opioid sparing. These are the drawbacks I've already discussed. Now coming to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which is the other step one drug that we use. Now, NSAIDs ex exerts its therapeutic effect by inhibiting the peripheral cyclooxygenase, like I mentioned earlier. Now, this is a very important enzyme in the arachidonic acid cascade, which produces the tissue and inflammatory prostaglandins, which actually mediate the pain and the inflammation. So, prostaglandins act by causing peripheral sensitization and it amplifies the pain. So this particular drug is effective for nociceptive pain associated with <coughs> Now, uh, this is what is peripheral sensitization. Then there's tissue damage. There's a release of tissue byproducts and inflammatory mediators. Here you can see that here. They are the bradykinin, the prostaglandins, the serotonin, cytokines, etc. And they form a kind of an inflammatory soup around the damaged tissue. And this is the one that causes the peripheral sensitivity. Causes an increased irritability and excitability of the nociceptor. This is a nociceptor, that is a peripheral nerve edge. And this leads to an amplification of the pain signal. And it also depends on the, the more the tissue damage, the more the peripheral sensitivity. So NSAIDs and all these anti-inflammatory drugs like COX inhibitors are acting at this level by decreasing the peripheral sensitivity. Now, uh, just to tell you once again how this acts, when there's a tissue injury, because of the injury, there is a release of phospholipids. This is converted to arachidonic acid which is ultimately converted into prostaglandins by this enzyme COX-2. So this is induced. It is not normally present. It is induced only when there's a tissue damage. And it causes the anti-inflammatory. But there is another COX that exists in the body, which is present in normal tissues. It's called the constitutive or the housekeeping enzyme. And it's responsible for the homeostatic functions of the stomach, the kidney, and the platelet. So when you give a COX inhibitor, which is non selective it is inhibiting both COX-1 and COX-2. By inhibiting COX-2, it is having the anti-inflammatory effect. But by inhibiting the COX-1, it has the adverse effect on this, these target. So there are two types of NSAIDs that are present. One is a non-selective, which interferes with both COX-1 and COX-2. And then we have the selective COX-2, which interferes only with COX-2 and does not inhibit the COX-1 in COX-1 enzyme. Now, 
Now, this is a classification of NSAIDs. We have the aspirin, the ibuprofen, and naproxen, and ketoprofen. Then we have the diclofenac, the piroxicam, ketorolac, indomethacin. This is a broad classification of the non selective COX. So, uh, the non selective NSAIDs, the prototypes are ibuprofen, naproxen, and aspirin. Inhibits both COX-1 and COX-2. Because it's inhibiting COX-1, it has its adverse effect, like the GI side effects, the hypersensitivity reactions, and the adverse renal effects. But by inhibiting COX-2, it is inhibiting the prostaglandin synthesis and it has the anti-inflammatory analgesic and anti -parity. So non-selective NSAIDs is a double-edged sword with both adverse and beneficial. So uh, this is uh, the prototype of non-selective uh, ibuprofen. The NNT you see is only is very good. It's two. That means for every two patients, one gets good relief of pain. And naproxen also has got a good NNT of 2.7. But the side effects it has got the renal effects, it has a GI effects, and it has a hypersensitivity. And all this is because of the COX-1. So we have to keep in mind the risk factors when we prescribe the non-selective NSAIDs and also the selective NSAIDs. For the non-selective, we have to be careful to avoid it in these patients who have risk for GI toxicity. They are elderly people. We should not give it for prolonged periods, those with upper GI symptoms and bleed, and those who are on aspirin and steroids and antiquities. Those for renal toxicity include Dehydration, very important. When we're giving NSAIDs, we have to ensure that the patient's hydration is very good. Concurrent use of nephrotoxic drugs and the creatinine clearance is low and advanced age, they are prone for renal damage. But this is for those COX-2 inhibitors. COX-2 inhibitors have been found to cause stroke and MI, that is thrombotic events. And this happens in these categories. Those with atherosclerotic heart disease, uh, vascular disease like diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, those with history of stroke, we have to be very careful when we are giving the COX-2, which I'll just talk about. Now, COX-2 inhibitors, they, I told you, they inhibit only the COX-2 and they do not inhibit COX-1. The drugs that we use are etoricoxib or eucoxia. Uh, or it's also etoshine, that's another drug that's available. It's given once a day dose. Then we have celicoxib, it's given twice daily. And diclofenac is functionally uh, actually a COX-2 inhibitor. Its NNT is very good as two, just like brufen and naprox. Uh, we also have topical NSAIDs, like uh, various gels and uh, uh, creams are available. They have the, some analgesic effect with less risk of systemic absorption and toxicity. You have various, uh, some of these agents in these gels. Now, NSAIDs can also be given, like I said, topically as gels, creams, and sprays, or it can even be given transdermally. Like you have diclofenac patches of 200 mg, which has to be given once a day. Or new patch, that's what it's now, the question we need to ask is, are selective COX-2 inhibitors safe as compared to non-selective COX-2? Now, where the GIT is concerned, it is safe as compared to the non-selective NSAIDs. But the renal damage is comparable with the non-selective NSAIDs. So it does not have a big advantage where the renal damage is concerned. On the other hand, it has poor thrombotic effects. And there's a more likelihood of myocardial infarction and stroke. So, in fact, this particular drug was taken off the U.S. market in 2004 because of these things. In such patients who are high risk for thrombotic events, then the drug of choice, the NSAID of choice, would be ibuprofen and naproxen. Now, uh, moving on to the step two drugs, that is the ones that are used for moderate pain or those not controlled with step two. Now, these are weak opioids, but they are not controlled drugs. So they are more easily available and more widely used as compared to the strong opioids. And sometimes you don't have to do this. You can even step, uh, move up the ladder and even skip the step. But very often we use these drugs. 
and the drugs that I will be discussing are Premadol and Pepetadol because that's what we call. Now, Premadol is actually a synthetic weak opioid. It has a dual method of action. The first is that it is an opioid receptor agonist, but it's a weak opioid. And because it's weak, it has got less tendency for respiratory depression and addiction. Also has a non-opioid mode of action, which is by blocking the presynaptic reuptake of serotonin and noradrenaline. That means it acts on the descending inhibitory pathway. It can be given for neuropathic pain as well. That's one advantage with Spremen. It is a pro-drug. That means it is converted to active metabolites for its analgesic action by the enzyme cytochrome P4. And the combination of tremadol and pasamol is widely used as a stem. Its oral bioavailability is very high, so it's very effective when given orally. Plasma half-life is only six hours, so it has to be six hours. The oral dose is very potent, it's one tenth as potent as morphine. If you want to calculate the equi analgesic dose of morphine, then you just divide uh, for patients getting 400 mg Tremadol, divide it by 10, then you know what is the equi analgesic dose of. It's given in a dose of 50 to 100 mg every 4 to 6 hours and do not exceed a dose of 400 mg. Sustained release formulations are also available, which you can take. Now, the side effects of Tremadol. It can cause nausea, vomiting, dry mouth, constipation, dizziness, etc. There is a risk of seizures when the total dose exceeds 400 mg or when you give it with drugs that lower the seizure threshold like the tricyclic antidepressants and the SSRIs. And also when you give it rapidly IV. So normally when you give IV, we give it over a period of 10 minutes along with an anti emetic Now the other weak opioid is Tepentadol. It is also a weak opioid, step two drug, but the opioid binding studies show that it is a strong opioid. 75 mg of tepentadol orally is equal to 30 mg of opioid. The mode of action is similar to tremadol. It has a dual mode. By one is acting as a mu receptor agonist, that is an opioid receptor agonist, and it also acts on the inhibitory pain pathways, which are the descending inhibitory pain pathways by preventing the reuptake of serotonin and noradrenaline, It's not a pro-drug. It has no active metabolism. The dose is all similar to tremor. 50 to 150 mg every 6 hours. Sustained release formulations are available. Do not exceed a dose of 600 mg. It has got a better side effect profile as compared to Trevodol with less risk of when you want to combine analgesics in patients with cancer, never use two drugs of the same category. Like we do not combine COX-1 and COX-2. We do not combine a weak opioid like Tremadol with a strong opioid like But the combinations that are favorable are like this. Parastamol or NSAID with morphine or parastamol with NSAIDs or parastamol with Tremadol. These are the favorable now, shifting gears and moving on to neuropathic pain. Now, we know that cancer pain is not just nociceptive. It can be associated with, there could be bowel obstruction, there could be bone pain, there could be neuropathic pain. In fact, 40% of cancer patients have neuropathy. Or there could be other associated symptoms like uh, insomnia, uh, nausea, vomiting, or there could be uh, anxiety, um, you know, and there could be muscle spasms. So there are a whole lot of symptoms associated with the cancer besides the nociceptive one. This is where the adjuvant drug, drugs come in. So these drugs have the primary indication is not pain. For example, an antidepressant. The primary indication is for treatment of depression or an anticonvulsant. The primary indication is treatment of convulsions. But it has got analgesic properties. So they are called co analgesics now, the classification of adjuvant drugs is based on the clinical symptoms. We have one category called the multipurpose drugs like antidepressants, corticosteroids, and the alpha-2 agonists that can be given for a variety of pains. But the others are like for neuropathic pain, bone pain, the drugs used for bone pain, the drugs used for bowel obstruction, or the drugs used for musculoskeletal pain. So these are all the adjuvant drugs that we can give for specific types. 
Now, just to uh, show a diagrammatic representation of the pain pathway, we you know that the nociceptor pain occurs at the site of tissue injury. But anything beyond this, that is in the peripheral nerve, that is a primary efferent neuron, or in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, or in the ascending pathways up to the brain, all this comes under the neuropathy. So neuropathic, while nociceptive pain is due to tissue injury, neuropathic pain is caused by a disease or lesion in the peripheral or in the central. There can also be a mixed pain with both nociceptive and neuropathic pain. That is what we need to elicit when we do an assessment of it. Now, neuropathic pain can be either because of a direct invasion or compression of the nerve, or it could be because of the treatment of cancer itself. Like we have the chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy or the radiation-induced peripheral neuropathy, or because of the surgical excision due to injury to the nerve, can also be there in cancer survivors and it can persist for months or years even after the treatment of cancer is successful because of the permanent nerve damage. And many patients, even after they are so-called cured of cancer, they still have neuropathy. This is something that we need to address. So the most commonly used drugs in neuropathic pain are the anticonvulsants, antidepressants, the step three drugs, step three opioids like methadone, and even the step two drugs like tramadol and tapoglitol because they are acting on the descending inhibitory pathway. And the less commonly used drugs are these. Now, anticonvulsants. This is a first line treatment for neuropathy. Why, is it, uh, why are anticonvulsants used for neuropathy pain? Because there's a shared pathophysiology between epilepsy and pain. In both, there is high neuronal hyperexcitement. And these drugs act by dampening the neuronal excitement. And these are the drugs that are common. So how do they act? We know that first method of action is it, it binds to the voltage-gated calcium channel, particularly the alpha-2 delta subunit of the presynaptic neuron. And it prevents the calcium influx into this. And because of that, there is decreased release of the excitatory neurotransmitters like uh, glutamate and aspartate. And because of this is less, there is less excitability in the postsynaptic. That is how the gabapentinoids act. These gabapentinoids include gabapentin and pre -gab. It also acts on sodium channels and it also acts by GABA-mediated synapse. But this is the predominant method by so, uh, if you look at the advantages of these drugs, it has got proven analgesic effect in neuropathic pain, well tolerated. But the side effects need to be kept in mind, like somnolence, dizziness, ataxia, fatigue, impaired concentration, weight gain. And this has to be explained to the patient. Uh, the, uh, if you want to compare the two drugs, this oral bioavailability is less predictable as compared to pregabalin, but it's definitely less expensive. And the titration is also slower, whereas this can be titrated in just two minutes. Topical drugs are available for neuropathy. Topical gabapentin is now available. And also topical capsaicin, 8%. It's a pungent component of chili pepper. It is not so freely available, but now capsaicin patches are also available. That is also can be used for neuropathy. Now, antidepressants. This is also another first-line treatment for neuropathy. But the onset of analgesic action takes about a week. It's not dependent on their antidepressant effect. It occurs earlier and at lower doses as compared to the antidepressant. And because of its antidepressant effect, it's useful in patients with cancer, with associated depression, anxiety. How do they act? They act by inhibiting the reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin at the dorsal spinal cord sinus. It activates the descending inhibitory pathway. Of the clinical, uh, the antidepressants in clinical use are the tricyclic antidepressants, the selective serotonin receptor inhibitor, the serotonin norepinephrine epinephrine receptor inhibitor, the SNRI, and then you have another category which is the NASA. 
that is a noradrenergic alpha-2 receptor antagonist with specific serotonin receptor antagonist. That example is metazine. And then you have atypical antipsychotics like quetiapine, risperidone, and balsamine. But the ones that are commonly used in cancer are basically the three types, which is a tricyclic antidepressants. They have amitriptyline and nortriptyline. This has got lesser side effect profile as compared to amitriptyline. Then you have the SNRI. We use duloxetine and venlafaxine. And the SSRI are the acetylopram, citalopram, peroxetine, etc. But the SSRI have a lesser analgesic effect as compared to the above two. But it is more useful for anxiety and depression. Look at the analgesic effect. TCA is got better than SNRI, which is better than SSRI. And if you look at the side effect profile, TCA has got more side effects as compared to SNRI. Now, the side effects we need to know for the tricyclic antidepressants, somnolence, drowsiness, mental clouding, suicidal tendency are the CNS side. But the anticholinergic or the antimuscarinic effects are dry mouth, acute angle glaucoma, blurred vision, tachycardia, urinary retention, constipation, and orthostatic hypertension. So the contraindications are avoid it in patients with heart disease, avoid in patients with prostatic hypertrophy and those with narrow anemia. Now coming to the SNRI, side effects are similar almost, somnolence, dizziness, constipation, etc. And the contraindications, we have to be very careful when we use venlafaxine when there is hepatic and duloxetine when there is hepatic. Look at the doses. So want to start with amitriptyline or nortriptyline. Start with a low dose of 10 mg, and then every three to five days you can go higher and up to 25 mg or even anticonvulsants. Also, gabapentin usually start with a low dose at night. All these drugs are preferably given the first dose at 200 mg or 300 mg HS, and then you can go up to. 1200 mg TDS as well, and uh, free gabalin at 75 mg sodium. But remember, dose adjustment is made for all medically ill patients, advanced age, and those with renal disease. So, appropriately, you have to try to so This was a study the effect of velocity for pain, function, and the quality of life in patients with CIP. It's a randomized controlled trial. And the individuals received duloxetine as initial treatment from weeks one to five. They had larger decrease in pain as compared to the placebo treatment. In the updated 2020 guidelines, duloxetine has been recommended as an initial treatment of painful CIP and given for five weeks. The other drugs that we use in neuropathy. Now, once again, let me go to this diagram. This is an NMDA receptor which is there in the dorsal horn of the spinal and ketamine blocks this NMDA receptor. It is used for neuropathic pain which is not responding to anticonvulsants. But it has got side effects like dysphoria, hallucinations. You can prevent it by giving either benzodiazepine or heroin. So use that. It can be given through a variety of foods. IV, IM, subcutaneous, oral, sublingual, even epidural, intrathecal. The bioavailability is, uh, IM bioavailability is very high, 90% and 5 So IM doses are very high. Now ketamine is basically an analgesic and some anesthetic doses. Oral ketamine can be given. Home setting it has been given, 10 to 25 mg TDS. Or you can give a subcutaneous or IV infusion, maximum dose of 200 mg per day, as a, into a syringe pump with uh, in a daycare center. Now, ketamine can also be given for difficult pain, intractable pain. It's called a burst ketamine. So you have to give it first at 100 mg for 24 hours, not effective, then step it up to 300 mg. That is not effective, then you can go up to 500 mg. And then this is called a pulse dose of ketamine for the treatment of intractable pain. Local anesthetics are also given for neuropathic pain. It's not uh, responding to the first line drugs. 
it acts by decreasing the neuronal excitability at the level of the cerebral channels. And it is usually given for the severe intractable placental type. You can give it as an IE local NSD. Xylocard is given. 5 mg per kg is calculated, added to 500 ml of normal saline, and you give it over one hour using a syringe. And of course, with cardiac monitoring and in a daycare center. Topical local anesthetic patches are now available. They are called Ludovelar patches. That's the brand that is available. They are 5 percent lidocaine patches. Three patches can be applied at, at one cell, at one time. But only thing to remember is you have to keep it for 12 hours and then remove it for the next 12 hours to avoid it. The other drugs, like I've already mentioned, you can give top, topical capsaicin or topical baba pendant to give. To look at the neuropathic pain ladder, the first line drugs are amitriptyline, pregabalin, baba pendant, uloxidine, and lidocaine patch. Second line are the opioids and tramadol, opioids, particularly methadone and the tramadol and tepentadol. And the third line drugs are baclofen, mexilidine, capsaicin, and Now coming to corticosteroids. This is, like I told you, a multi-purpose thing. That means it can be given for a number of causes, like neuropathic pain, bone pain, headache because of intracranial metastasis, pain due to a bowel obstruction or organ capsule distension, or even pain from spinal nerves. So, if you look at the various drugs that are given, the steroids, hydrocortisone, prednisolone, and dexamethasone. Please note that dexamethasone's anti-inflammatory action is 25 to 50 times as compared to hydrocortisone. And also, its duration of action is 36 minutes. So, it can be given once a day dose, and that is what we prefer to give to cancer has got potent anti inflammatory effect with less mineral or corticoid. And it can be, uh, it can cause insomnia. All steroids can cause insomnia, so give it a thumb. Steroids have been found to provide short-term relief of pain, and so they are very beneficial in less life experience. The dose of dexamethasone for mild brain metastasis that is uh, not very severe, you can give 4 to 8 mg every once a day. Severe, you can go up to 16. For malignant bowel obstruction, you can go between 6 to 16. Also, an appetite stimulant. Now, GABA receptor agents. These are another category of adjuvant drugs that we give for cancer. Now, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and these agonists are actually potentiating the inhibitory effect of GABA. So you have two GABA receptor agonists. One is GABA A agonists, which uh, the they, they come the benzodiazepines come under this category. Of the benzodiazepines, clonazepam that is one that is particularly useful in cancer patients, not only to treat neuropathic pain but also for sedation and even for terminal sedation. And GABA B agonist is baclofen. Like I mentioned, you can give it for neuropathic pain in a dose of. 0.25 to 0.5 milligrams uh, uh, per orally or in terminal sedation also you can give even as a sub, uh, continuous subcutaneous. Then baclofen called liorazole is a GABA B agonist and it's effective for a number of situations like spasticity, trigeminal neuralgia, neuropathic pain, hiccup and musculoskeletal spasms. We all know the dose in which we give it. We start with 5 mg BD or TDS and you can keep Now, bone pain, metastatic bone disease causes what is called skeletal related events. And that can be very agonizing, whether it's a fracture or whether it's a bone mess, and it affects the quality of so The various agents that are given for bone pain, which you all are more familiar than me, are the corticosteroids, the you know, NSAIDs, calcitonin. But latest reviews show that it does not significantly improve the quality of Then, of course, we have the bisphosphonates and dinosomab and palliative So If you look at the bisphosphonates, we can give it for intractable metastatic bone pain in a variety of conditions. They act by blocking the osteoclastic activity and bone resorption. Tolidronic acid is what I 
I am I come across and you give it in a dose of IV four milligram in hundred ml over fifteen minutes once in four weeks for a year. But must remember the side effects like pyrexia, renal dysfunction, and osteonecrosis. Also, even patients with increased creatinine clearance, we need to reduce. If you look at compare the two uh, agents that are given, bisphosphonates and nilosumab. This is definitely more expensive. It's given subcutaneously, less risk of renal toxicity, but more risk of hypocalcemia. And it is superior as compared to the bisphosphonates to prevent and delay the skeletal related events with a better median survival. But it is very expensive. Like if you were the treatment for one month of dinosaurus around 32,000, whereas olidronic acid is just about 900. Then, of course, you have the palliative radiation. And uh, I think you people are more familiar <laughs> than me. So I just keep this. And malignant bowel obstruction, we can use either steroids, we can use octotype, which is a somatostatin analog. It's a synthetic hormone that decreases the intraluminal secretions and peristaltic. And of course, you can give the anticholinergic drugs like hyoscine, butyl, bromide, or glycopine. Or you can combine all of them. Other adjuvant drugs that we can use are the skeletal muscle relaxants or the neuroleptics, particularly when there is delirium and agitation, like olanzapine. Then you can give antibiotics if there are infection or sedatives and anxiolytics and laxatives. So these are some of the other adjuvant drugs that we give. So if you look at the site of action of these analgesic drugs, like muscle relaxants are acting at this level, at the neuromuscular junction. Now, local anesthetics, topical analgesics, and NSAIDs are acting by preventing the peripheral sensitization of the nerve. Then you have the nociceptor, where the local anesthetics and the NSAIDs are acting. And at the level of the dorsal horn of the spinal cord are the drugs like anticonvulsants, antidepressants, opioids, and the NMD. And the descending, in, this is a descending inhibitory pathway. It's coming down to uh, prevent the pain impulse from going upwards. So the ones that act here are the ones that are the, uh, that prevent the release, uh, reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. They include alpha-2 agonists, the tricyclic antidepressants, the SNRI, and the weak opioids like tramadol and tetanol. So this is a, so when you sometimes combine the drugs, you can combine it so that different parts of the pain pathway are attached. So that is the idea of com combining various kinds of uh, drugs of the WHO energy. Now coming back to our case scenario. Now we know that this is a 35-year-old uh, father of two young children. He had a pain in the right shoulder with burning tingling in the right arm, unable to sleep. And he was depressed. So if you want to, uh, points to be considered are the intensity of pain was mild, but the type of pain was, uh, sorry, was both nociceptive and neuropathic as well because he had pain radiating down the arm. It was worse at night, so that's the temporal nature of it. And if you unveil the meaning of pain, there were functional, emotional, social, and financial concerns. So we need to do a total pain management for this step. So you can combine the WHO step one drugs because his pain was mild pain. So you can give a combination of paracetamol and NSAIDs. But because he had no pain at night, maybe we could step up the dose of the drug at night. Like you can give a sustained release preparation at night. Paracetamol 1000 milligram or diclofenac SR. You can add an adjuvant drug so that he gets a better sleep. The sleep is good, the pain threshold itself is decreased. Oh, sorry, pain threshold is increased. So that they uh, is not transmitted. And of course, we must address the psychosocial by addressing his financial and social concerns. So, in summary, summary the WHO analgesic ladder is a sheet anchor of cancer pain management, can also be used for cancer pain. Its main advantages is its simplicity and easy implementation. And most of all, it has legitimized the use of strong opioids in cancer. Thank you.
thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you so much, Madam, for the very informative, highly informative session. Uh, and we have two questions in the chat box by Dr. Akhil Kabur. Uh, one is, uh, what about the dose of steroids in malignant bowel obstruction? Actually, the worry is that they can mask the symptoms of perforation as well. That's one question, ma'am. And another one is related to the strong opioids. Is it okay to combine fentanyl patch with sublingual buprenorphine for breakthrough pain? Ma'am, can you uh, answer the first question regarding the bowel obstruction and steroids? Uh, see, uh, the risk of perforation is there, but even then, steroids can pro provide uh, some relief of pain and some relief of symptoms. So it should be given as a short course, like uh, maximum for four to five days. That's what we have done that uh, if there's anything, anybody else can give any other opinion. It can provide short-term relief for you. We have to sometimes very often weigh the risk and benefits of anything. There is a risk, there's a benefit. But if the benefits are outweighing the risk, then we have to take it. True, ma'am. Ma uh, is there anybody point? else with any other opinion? Because you all are more familiar in treating all this. Uh, it can be interactive. It's not necessary that Manu and I have to answer the question. All of you all can answer every question. Uh, So the other question is, is it okay to combine fentanyl pad with sublingual buprenorphine for breakthrough pain? Yes, ma'am. Now, uh, you know, for breakthrough pain, actually there's another topic called difficult pain in which I have discussed this actually. Is we have got even fentanyl lollipops that are available. It's called OTFC, Oral Transmucosal Fentanyl Citrate. And 200 mics lollipops are available that can be kept under the, in the cheek and slowly sucked. So if you're giving fentanyl patch, that would be preferable. Although you can give sublingual buprenorphine as well. But when you have a fentanyl lollipop, then in a patient getting fentanyl, that would be the best. But if you, you uh, definitely that sublu sublingual buprenorphine is also used to treat the brain. But I just want to inform you that even fentanyl lollipops, it's called OTFC, are also available. 200 mics available. Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, uh, okay, could you just explain about NNT, the concept of NNT again? Now, numbers needed to treat are the number of patients who receive a particular drug for one to get good relief of it. Okay. Now, if a patient, uh, five patients are getting Pastamol 650 NG, then only one person will get good relief. So the numbers needed to treat is five. Whereas for Bufen, for two. two people, one will get good relief of it. So okay. it is, the lower the NNT, the more efficacious is the NNT. This is a very... It's a uh, tool that can be applied to compare the efficacy of various drugs. So, ma'am, thank you, ma'am. Uh, one more question is that in liver metastasis or in hepatocellular or carcinoma, we are quite hesitant. People, the patients are really there. They have very pain to, due to the capsular stretch pain. So, uh, the, it's, been, it's been told that less than 4 gram of paracetamol can be given. But is there any cutoff for the bilirubin levels like patients with 10 or 15 uh, milligram of bilirubin, is there any cutoffs of using paracetamol in such patients or should we avoid paracetamol in those patients? I think we can also look at the enzymes, SCOT, SGPT, yes, which is more indicative. So if yes. it is very, very high, they say what is recommended, I have read, is that up to 2 grams or 3 grams can be given. We can stick to even 2 grams also. Okay. That can be given even in patients with liver disease. And for that capsular means, stretch, even steroids are effective. Yes, yes, sir. That's all. But so uh, it won't lead to a sudden hepatic failure or something. Because in casualties, what we have come to know that whenever whenever there's a patient with HCC or liver, they're hesitant to give any sort of drugs. 
and the, till the time we come to the casualty the patient will be with the pain and they won't start any and the first on the basic uh, painkiller is pa paracetamol they are very hesitant to give even a tablet of 650 stating that it is hepatotoxic so we Maybe have that. instead of 650 we can start off with 500 mg okay and okay. then give a, like they say uh, restrict to less than 2 grams that much oh, even, if we, yeah, even if we give a 1 gram of iv of paracetamol it won't be a problem even if yes. the patient has got hcc yes ma'am again for tramadol also it is seizure inducing drugs yeah. Uh, so, patient with the brain metastasis, uh, you, you should that you should avoid totally avoid tramadol or um, oh, no. we, we give it even for patients with brain pain medicine. Give it give it slowly. You're giving mm -hmm. IV. You give it slowly and uh, mm -hmm. restrict the dose that you're giving. But uh, I'm a neuroanesthetist, so I've been treating a lot of people with uh, uh, this, okay. and uh, so we have been using tramadol also. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of misconceptions regarding this use of tramadol in people yeah. with brain meds and use of paracetamol in patients with HCC or liver meds. I yeah. just wanted to clear about that. Yeah, we can yeah. give it, uh, of course, we don't go high doses, like 50 mg TDS and all can easily be given. Okay, ma'am. And ma'am, the use of fent fentanyl patch, uh, after using a fentanyl patch about 24 50, we should actually give a, a time frame of 12 hours for the next patch. Yes, 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 yes. It is always like 12 hours or can we give it at like 8 hours because there are certain papers stating 8 to 12 hours gap, certain papers stating six, 16 hours gap. So what is our correct ideal time period between the next patch? I, as far as I know, it is 12 hours. 12 hours. Okay. Thank you, Sai. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, madam, uh, can I ask a question about uh, flopertin malate? Do you have any uh, recommendations regarding flopertin malate? Uh, uh, Sorry, I don't have it. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Uh, ma about uh, ketamine, is there any oral preparation available or are we giving the no, IV? No, the same IV preparation is being given. Okay. We don't have a separate formulation for it. But I've not used much of ketamine. I don't know whether the pallium people are using more. But I, in my practice, I've not, not used ketamine for them. Okay, ma'am. Uh, in Calicut, I, uh, IPM, they use uh, sublingual uh, use of this ketamine. Uh, you can mix it with something and give it to you, like some sweet thing, because it may be quite bitter to taste. Right, ma'am. Are there other questions you can post even uh, through the chat box or you can ask directly by unmuting? And there are no case discussions no, after this. No, we don't have case presentation for this program. So thank you, ma'am. Uh, this is Dr. Akhil Kapoor from uh, Tata Memorial Hospital, Varanasi. So... Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, lecture and the interactive discussions. Um, at our center, uh, we utilize more than 50,000 morphine tablets per year. And uh, last month, the utilization of fentanyl patch and was uh, more than 5,000 patches in a month. And buprenorphine patches, we utilized in the last six months close to 30,000 patches. So that speaks about uh, the burden of pain in our patients in cancer patients, which are mostly advanced patients. So these are very uh, important and uh, points which you have discussed. I uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks for the same. Very, very, uh, very uh, heartening to know that so many patients are getting benefited. The yes, amount right. of drugs that you're using, it only shows that uh, that NDPS Act that was amended sometime in 2014 has really made a difference to the availability of these drugs. Yes, because earlier there was so much restriction used with the uh, strong opioids, but now thanks to the work of so many people, including Dr. Raj Gopal, that uh, Act was amended, and now it is so much more easy to procure these drugs. And it's, uh, a lot of cancer patients are now getting the care that they deserve and the pain relief that they deserve. 
correct ma'am and also we are not uh, previously every physician was so much worried of using the opioids now each of us are well trained and uh, aware of the toxicities and how to manage the toxicities that gives us more confidence to utilize the drug uh, yes. well in and, the and now more and more people are attending all these online courses so many people are attending that uh, this is message is going to spread even more and in fact uh, my colleague was telling me the other day that even though i'm not a palliative care physician can i prescribe more people so I, i i don't know whether i'm right or wrong i said as long as you're an mbbs doctor and you have a dd12 form you can prescribe the thing with your registration number am i right You don't yes, have to be yes, a palliative sir. care doctor to prescribe. No, 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 nothing like that. No. Anybody. So, what, the, so is, even yeah, among uh, my colleagues, that misconception is there. That uh, can I do it? I said, of course. She's an MD anesthesiologist. She can definitely prescribe. Uh, yeah, so, anesthesiologists uh, are also one of the best persons to prescribe these drugs. Yeah. Because now, and and the anesthesiology, anesthesia, and critical pain management as well, apart from critical care. So, yes. Exactly. So all of us should now be uh, uh, open yeah, to prescribing, everyone. but at the same time, when we see the epidemic of uh, opioid epidemic that's happening in the Western countries, and so many people are dying every day, so for non-cancer pain, we should be very cautious and judicious when we prescribe strong opioids. So, as a rule, I don't prescribe uh, opioids for non-cancer. No, okay, ma'am. No, okay, As a rule, I don't do it because these may be young people who are going to live for so many years, and when we mm -hmm. see the deaths that are happening abroad, the epidemic mm -hmm. that's happening abroad, we don't want to go the same route. So for mm -hmm. cancer pain, I'm a proponent of opioids, but not for non-cancer. Correct, ma'am. Thank you. Are there any more questions? There are no more questions in the chat box. So one more question, one more doubt. Sure, sure. Go ahead, uh, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, is there any specific protocol for tapering of the morphine doses after the initial when you start with the ten milligram or five milligram both hourly? How should we taper it? Is there any specific protocol, or is it I'm not, I'm not uh, aware of any specific protocol, but I think we should keep monitoring the NRS of the patient, and if the patient's uh, stabilizing, then we must try to de-escalate. Because they are all patients who get morphine develop tolerance, right? Yes, sir. So we have to be. It has to be uh, tapered off very gradually to prevent withdrawal effect. Okay. So uh, they have a physical dependence. This is different from yeah. psychological dependence. Anyone getting strong opioids get a physical dependence. So it's very important to taper it off gradually, depending upon the patient comfort and the NRS scores. He escalated in a gradual. Okay. I, so I'm not aware of any particular. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, madam. One one more question. Uh, how about the antiemetics of choice, which should be given along with tramadol? You had mentioned IV tramadol along with uh, yeah, anti antiemetics. So which one do you prefer? Any? Uh, I usually give or dance it for. Okay. With tramadol, I've always used it as an anesthetic, as an anesthesiologist. That is my thing. I don't know if there's anything else, but I would always combine with tramadol, uh, and that is mainly for IV tramadol. For oral tramadol, I don't even give an antiemetic unless a patient has symptoms. So, if they have symptoms, then I avoid tramadol altogether. But for intravenous tramadol, I definitely give it. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. If there are no more questions. Can we wind up the session? Rajalakshmi, can you take over? Yes, I yes.